Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome once again. I hope you enjoyed uh, your sandwiches. Um, I'm Helen Marshall. I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University with responsibility for curriculum and external engagement. And I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker this evening. He was described by the Times in 2008 as the most connected lawyer in the city. He joined Clifford Chance in 1976, qualified as a solicitor two years later, and was elected to partnership in 1984. During his time at Clifford Chance, he held increasingly senior roles, leading the banking and finance areas between 1999 and 2003. Among the major projects in which Stuart has been heavily involved was the MFI buyout in 1989, which at the time was the largest of its kind. He was also a key player in the 1997 restructuring of Lloyds of London. Stuart was elected senior partner worldwide of Clifford Chance in 2003 and re-elected to a second term at the head of the UK's largest law firm. That would be enough for most people. But last year, the financial services giant Citigroup appointed Stuart as vice chair of banking for Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Stuart has shown a remarkable talent for bringing people together and has regularly accompanied prime ministers on both sides of the political divide in their respective trade missions to China and India. <coughs> While he has an international outlook, he sits on the EU advisory board for the Corporation of the City of London and is an international envoy for London, our speaker remains firmly grounded in the world of local communities in which major companies and universities work. He's a trustee for Tower Hamlets Business Education Partnership and a director of Planet Finance, a charity which promotes microfinance to assist the alleviation of poverty. It's appropriate that Stuart should give a lecture today at what is not just a business gathering, but also a university event. For he has a strong pedigree in higher education. He is a member of the Business Advisory Forum, the Said Business School at Oxford University, and in July this year will take over as chairman of the internationally renowned think tank, Chatham House. The financial crisis and its effect on the economy is perhaps the defining issue of our generation. The role of business in the recovery is hotly debated, and the prospects for growth in the financial services sector are seen by many as a barometer of the economic health of our country. As the First Minister and the Vice-Chancellor said downstairs, it's also a key engine for growth here in Cardiff and the rest of Wales. There could be no more an appropriate person to speak to those issues today than our keynote speaker tonight, who is with us in his capacity of Chairman of City UK, the representative body which promotes the UK's Financial Services Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker tonight, Stuart Popham. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for uh, that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to address you here uh, this evening. What I would like to do is first uh, start by congratulating the university on setting out its strategy so clearly in what I consider to be absolutely the, uh, the right approach to the provision of education for professional and financial services. Uh, and I'm sure, absolutely sure, that the new centre will be a great success. Let me further go on um, and congratulate uh, actually the Principality because it seems to me just as described by the First Minister uh, that in pursuing policies in engaging with business and the providers of education in the belief that together they can make a better product is absolutely right. And I mentioned to the, the First Minister that it was relatively unusual for me to speak or rather to listen to a politician who appeared to be welcoming financial services, uh, where generally, uh, and I'm afraid I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, the, the mood and the atmosphere um, uh, is, is no longer um, one where, where hoodies are, are feared, but possibly bankers. Uh, and we will want to go, I can speak now as a banker, although possibly the oldest, newest banker you've ever met, um, 
we will go, uh, and business will want to be uh, centred in places where they're welcome. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit further about that. I'll seek to address three issues uh, this evening. First, why I believe it is the right approach for the university. Secondly, I will speak about the need, I believe, to move on in terms of the current view of financial services and their regulation and reputation. And finally, I'd like to outline what I see as the challenge for professional services in the years to come. So I really am very uh, pleased to have had this opportunity. Um, in, in that generous introduction that you made, you weren't actually able to comment on my upbringing. Uh, and I should say very proudly that my father and my brother were both born in Cardiff. <clears throat> my mother was brought up in Penarth, and my grandfather captained coal, coal transporting ships out of the docks here for 30 years. So I can claim a very direct affinity with Glamorgan. Uh, but my parents had moved to England by the time I was born. But still, uh, many of my relatives uh, live nearby, uh, so perhaps I can claim this in some respects as a second home. If there's one thing that really upsets me, uh, and I find it very difficult to control that uh, level of upset, it's when business people, organisations, media, complain about the quality of education in the United Kingdom. If they complain that the basic teaching is poor, or that students or new joiners in a company lack skills, then it seems to me they should do something about it. It's no good saying to universities, try again and in three years' time, we'll see if you produced a better result. Or secondary schools, try seven years and see what happens then. Those business people, I think, should see that they have a responsibility to assist and to train people. So they should be offering to help at primary level, at secondary level, and also at tertiary level. Reference was made to my being on the Tower Hamlets Business Education Partnership, an area where the most deprived uh, borough in London benefits from business people joining schools at primary level or otherwise and effectively uh, teaching and assisting teaching even the youngest of children, where I think it makes a huge difference. But business has to work, in my belief, in partnership with educators to provide people with the right level of ability and the means to apply their knowledge in practice, in real life. Frankly, I've never met anyone who doesn't want to talk about their job or who would like to tell you the skills needed to do their job and how to succeed in their job. But we need to spread that word to the next generations. We are, I think, as someone once said, in this all together. So we have to produce, I believe, a collective solution. We need to ensure that the population today, and more importantly tomorrow, has ample employment opportunities. The forefathers of this university looked outwards and determined that they should seek to train what I will call coal miners, or better still, the working man and the working woman. And it's still doing that with this new centre. Better still, the university looks outwards, beyond the immediate community, and beyond that even internationally. And as a trading nation, and one that survives, indeed flourishes on our wits, we have to be seen as the international friend, welcoming all who share our values. I'm sure you've all heard too many statistics about develop the developing world, but let me add a couple that I saw only the other day. Between now and 2020, China will move 300 million people from the land to the city. By 2025, China will build 10 new cities, each larger than the size of New York. I mention this because all those people will need financial and professional services to live and to build those cities and all that a city needs. And our universities should be at the centre of those developments and our professional services should seek out the opportunities that those developments offer. So never more so do we need to train our workforce to skill us all for the future and for our people to succeed and to prosper. So I applaud all means by which educational establishments reach out to business, and business needs to partner, as I say, with schools, colleges, universities, to work together to produce the skilled workforce of the future. In focusing on professional services, and then not only to the professionally qualified, but to all those involved in the professional services, I consider the new school's approach to be absolutely on target, and really a first. I will turn, though, to the challenge for professional and financial services specifically a little later. And I know that I tread on dangerous ground when I say that our educational system 
has to ensure that it gets the balance right between encouraging learning and actually focusing on training. We all need to have the skill of learning, but perhaps 99% of all students study in order to find a better job or to find a better job or to put themselves in that better position. So they need training. Recent investigations I saw uh, suggest that British business as a whole will spend some £18 billion in the coming year on training of workforces. And I have the very distinct sense that many would be, or much of that would be much better spent by using that money with the nearby university or a further education college and asking them to do a large part of the training. It wasn't always the case. It seemed to me that the better lawyers in my firm were necessarily good educators. We, we needed to use professionally qualified uh, educators to train, and that's what we did over the years, and it produced a much better, a much better result. And those colleges, those universities, will, I think, produce smart courses, weekend courses, day release courses, tailored courses delivered to the workplace, which must be a significant opportunity for Glamorgan. So I encourage all of you to consider further and wider where you can help in that education, in training, and the challenge. And look to the Chambers of Commerce, look to the professional bodies, look to larger businesses, and indeed local government, to see whether university can add value and vice versa. I have a particularly strong belief in the British standard, whether that is of the gold or silver assay, the GCSE, the A-level, the qualification of solicitor, or perhaps just the definition of Greenwich Mean Time. Because it is by those standards that we are judged, and the maintenance of the highest standards will see us succeed. So it seems to me that the university should be congratulated. They're set on the right course, and it's for us to make sure that they stay that course. I'm also reminded from my travels and periods of living abroad that if foreign students travel to the UK so as to be trained to the UK standard, they're likely to, to do business with British companies, perhaps to work here, and certainly to spread the good news to market the UK around the world. You will, I'm sure, be familiar with the, with the description that John Macefield gave of universities. In one part where he says, where those who hate ignorance strive to know, whose seekers and learners alike banded together search for knowledge, uphold dignity and exact standards. And above all, a university will provide future leaders and continue to educate those leaders. We all know that education is for life and we need continually to be educated. Just an example, I suppose, of life's unpredictability in that he never actually said this. But on the day that he was assassinated, John F. Kennedy was due to give a speech in which he was going to say something rather simple but worth remembering, which was that leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. I said I would speak about the need for financial services to move on from the current view and to address their reputation. Financial services have undoubtedly done much to be ashamed of, much to regret, although you could be forgiven for thinking that all that's wrong about the economy, indeed the world at large, is due to the financial services industry if you were to listen merely to politicians and the press alone. It is quite literally the pantomime baddie, and that vision is firmly stuck in the group. Whatever they've done in the last four years or so has not actually moved the needle from zero at all when you look at their reputation or their public image. In many respects, I describe it as running up the down escalator. Whatever it is we try to do, somehow we never actually get there. So while banks, insurance companies, investment managers and the like should be fueling the engines of growth, lending to business, employing school leavers, helping build the infrastructure the country so needs, they are actually criticized for not doing enough, for not having learnt lessons, for not being on the same planet. The balance is wrong, and we need to see this now as a glass which is half full, not half empty. We need to challenge financial services to help rather than just criticize them. Absolutely everyone in education will know that you don't change behavior solely by criticism. So I think there are two very clear mistakes that I'd like to share with you today in that present view. First, actually, as the First Minister said, uh, there are over a million, 1.2 million people employed in financial services in the UK, and that reaches nearly 2 million when you include the related professional services of accountants, lawyers, actuaries, statisticians who are interdependent uh, on each other. 
And the majority of those, as you know, uh, do not work in London. Funnily enough, it was not a statistic known. I sat on a, a commission with Alistair Darling uh, and Wynne Bischoff, the then chairman of City uh, Bank in 2007, when we were looking at the competitiveness of financial services in the UK, how could we maintain it? Little did we know there was a Titanic-like iceberg coming towards us. Nonetheless, it was a discovery to all of us to see that the majority, the vast majority, 60% of those involved in financial services work outside of the M25 corridor. Quite literally, there are people in every street and certainly in every political constituency who work in financial services, who need encouragement, perhaps, to be set more effective goals, but rather than to be uh, criticised at all times. And it seems something of a, of a well-kept secret that there are 124,000 employees in financial and professional services based here in Wales. And when I look around the room, that seems to me self-evident. And when I sought to navigate a couple of miles in my car earlier on in the afternoon, I think I saw most financial institutions in Cardiff uh, uh, in a sort of circular way in which I found myself driving. But in Cardiff, 15% of GVA, that's to say gross value added, the, the uh, statistical measurement most used by economists, 15% of GVA of Cardiff is actually created by financial and professional services, 15%. And some 3.9 billion of GVA uh, is uh, contributed in Wales as a whole. 8.4% of the economy of Wales is generated by professional and financial services. But there is room, there is room for more. And I'd like to make one point, which is very, very few of those two million are on salaries, including bonuses, which take them above average earnings, and still less than 1%, possibly less than 0.1%, one in a 1,000, are paid bonuses of five figures or more. And yet the popular opinion is of the overweight feline, uh, the one that the press prefer uh, to focus upon. So I would like to move on from that, and I'll show you how I believe that to be the case in a minute. Secondly, the world of finance has actually changed dramatically. Do you know more regulation has been brought into law for financial services since 2007 than in the entirety of history before then? It would be impossible for any one person to read the totality of that law that's been introduced, uh, irrespective of how long they lived. I think it would be some 200 years worth of reading. Much of that has yet to be implemented, so the changes that people want to see happen have not yet come. But actually, much has. And you might, for example, uh, not recognise the fact that complying with the capital requirements of Basel III, which was the first action of the G20 when it met in London in 2008, was when they were taking actions designed to reduce the, sec uh, the risk in the sector. The implementation of Basel III so far has reduced the capacity of the UK clearing banks to lend to business and individuals by over £100 billion which they now have to keep in cash. Safer as institutions, yes, but far less able to help society and build a better economy. We at the City UK, and I think it was slightly ironic that I'm employed in City UK and the City UK uh, at the same time, so differentiating from the bank to the promotional organisation, a partnership, a partnership intended to promote financial and related professional services, seek to do that and to represent all of the financial services and related professional services from across the UK. Individual sectors can best promote themselves, but we, I believe, can add the benefit of looking at the entire sector, linking one part with another, showing government and regulators often the impact of rule changes of one sector, in one sector on another. So, for example, Solvency II, which is the new regulatory environment for insurance companies, uh, will require insurance companies to hold more short-term liquid assets. That means the very same insurance companies that the government is looking to to buy uh, equity capital in banks will be that much less able to do so. So the two individual areas will not actually, in a sense, equate to a reduced risk. That cross-cutting thinking, I think, is essential, but is often not considered. And we can help, and we do help at the City UK, in overseas missions, better showcasing the opportunities to do business across the UK. And we can help, I think, promote the centres, the devolved centres, the dissolved, sorry, the devolved regions, the cities throughout the UK where financial and professional services are developing. 
It needs, I think, to be stressed that the benefits of financial services are for the country as a whole. Rebalancing that view of financial services has been a challenge. It seems to me that it isn't necessary for financial services to shrink in order for other parts of industry, for example, to grow. And I hope it will be seen that actually financial services have to be at the centre of growing the rest of the economy and not by shrinking will the rest of us succeed. So at this stage, I thought I might just share with you a definition of insurance that I heard uh, the other day. Um, we'll call her the farmer's wife who rings the insurance company and tells them that the barn has burnt down. And would they kindly send her a cheque for £20,000 because that's the insured value of the barn. The insurer takes a little time and, and seeks to explain that actually um, they, need, they need really to assess the loss. They need to determine what the value was of the barn, what the loss is that's occasioned by the burning down of the barn. They'll have to send a loss adjuster because really what was her loss? Hmm, she says. She thinks about it for a while and says, actually, I think you better cancel the life insurance on my husband. <laughs> So that's insurance. I believe, though, that the financial services sector has to accept that it is in the public eye, that the public believes that it bailed out all of them, all of us, and yet, though still uh, in the public's eye, the financial services organisations don't appear to have changed their behaviour. And in today's world, and the big change in today's world, is that we have to respond to and deal with perceptions rather than realities. So it's for the sector to explain itself, something actually we at the City UK do a lot of and happy to do so, and then it's for all of us, particularly politicians, to move on. Financial services companies, I believe, have to stop saying that they are not banks, or that, for example, banks need to stop saying that they weren't the banks that got into trouble, because who can really tell one from another? And as far as the public are concerned, we're all in it together. So wouldn't we feel happier, actually, if we collectively say, well, we got it wrong? But more to the point, together, all of us will now act to get it right. To emphasise that they're focused on helping outcomes, on helping their immediate environment and society, and accept that responsibility. Many, many are doing just that, but few are listening. Financial services has, quite frankly, lost the right to speak. And it has to regain that voice. At the moment, I'm afraid, whenever we seek to justify ourselves, that phrase from Mandy Rice Davis, they would say that, wouldn't they, is normally the one that is uh, the retort. On every high street, in every village, there are, as I say, financial uh, services people represented. They're ordinary citizens going about an ordinary day's work, doing a decent day's work for a decent day's pay, and who have to be seen as part of society. Financial services are about everyday life. I've been going around a number of business schools recently and I've posed them this question, so I'll pose it to you. Do you know how many financial transactions it takes to put the cup of tea on your breakfast table in the morning? Random guess, anybody? I reckon it's about 10 or 11, and I can cite those for you. But at a business school recently, somebody provided me with 14. It is about everyday life and we have to make sure that it's seen as that and not something apart. So if there was one change I would seek, it would be the formulation of a vision by the industry and government, centrally and devolved, as to where we actually want our financial services to be in, say, 10 years' time. Away from the name-calling, away from the politics of it, but actually not just saying, OK, you're in the wrong place. It's a bit like handing the man in the hole another spade with which to dig. But where do we actually want financial services to be in 10 years' time? So then they could be judged against the progress, not just an annual target, but a 10-year target, away from, the, as I say, the politics, so that they can be providing insurance, providing investment advice, helping people save for their pensions, lending to businesses large and small in an agreed way of trying to find uh, that ultimate position we should be in. I led a group of 30 or so people last year trying to do that. I failed to engage sufficiently with the Chancellor to persuade him. Initially, he thought it was a good idea, and then he came no further. So I had 30 people, all under the age of 40, 
from across the UK in financial services because I thought they will be leading the industry in 10 years' time, not um, overweight, overage people like me, but people who would actually see a vision for their work, for their business. And they set it out brilliantly. It's on the website for the City UK. But there was one phrase in there that really sort of struck home to me. And they said that their vision of financial services had to be a situation where financial services were seen as part of society, not apart from society. I've often wondered what it means to be working not in the real economy. Is it the unreal economy that financial services occupy? The surreal economy? We're actually part of the same economy, but we need to persuade people that it is that same one. Financial services raised £63 billion, or generated £63 billion in tax last year. Net exports of £38 billion. Net exports of £38 billion, the largest single contributor to the balance of payments, and represented nearly 9% of the UK's GDP, 13.5% if you take into account the financial services and related professional services. So yes, we have to grow that business, but don't kill it. It's a world beater. It will maintain jobs by servicing India, China, all those other developing nations. Every country wants to be or have an international financial centre. It's absolutely critical that we should have one. There is a war of attraction going on, seeking to entice people from the industry to move to those new centres in Singapore, in Dubai, or in New York, in Shanghai. We want them to work in the UK, to work in Cardiff, to work in Belfast, to work in Edinburgh, and to work in London. It's critical for the economy that we best use the strength of that industry, put the past behind, and together encourage financial services to help restore the economy, to look to the future with hope and encouragement. So now to my third topic, and that's looking at professional services and their future as I see it, or more the challenges to their future. Those in accountancy, law, insurance, actuaries, brokers, investment managers, they've gained reputation because they are well-trained and they maintain standards, UK standards. They operate within the rule of law. You know where you stand, I think is what one would say, when you use a British professional. Those standards travel the world, and to a very large extent, they depend upon the developing world now, and vice versa. As economies develop, they need to build, to develop services and facilities for their population. That is what the service businesses today are doing. And it's what we have to do if we want to ensure that future generations have jobs and if we are to achieve the economic growth and to make our way in the world, then actually we have to sell our services to the world. And we do. But we have no right to do so, no enduring right to do so. We have to fight for it. Now, it's not an exact analogy, but it was something that I was struck by when I visited, uh, as you mentioned earlier, China uh, with uh, the Prime Minister. And we were shown, this is some four, five years ago, we were shown um, the new airport terminal in Beijing, Terminal 3. It was built because the Chinese realized that they were going to have that many visitors in anticipation of the Olympics, that they needed to build a gateway airport. They were going to have hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of people passing through there. So they built a terminal. If you've ever seen it, it's 25% bigger than the entirety of the Heathrow terminals put together. It even has a railway from one end to the other, but the difference is that's inside the building. On the first day of construction, 40,000 workers turned up. 40,000 workers turned up to start. And they built it within four years. And while those workers were locally employed, the architect, the structural engineer, the consulting engineer, the electrical, the mechanical, and other service providers all had one distinction. They were British. We provided the expertise, the standards, the professions, and therein lies, I think, our future. But we also have to see, and here is the challenge, I believe, that professions are also businesses. I absolutely totally believe it is possible to be both a professional and run as a business. When I started, I think that was not the case. When I started 36, 37 years ago as, a, as, as an articled clerk, it was not really considered appropriate to run a professional practice as a business. Today, today's professional, be they a lawyer, an accountant, whatever, they have to be. And they have to have the skills, I think, of many. They have to have the skills of a finance director. Because they have to ensure that their business is financially sustainable, has the right level and structure of capital, collects its debts, 
buys its supplies efficiently. Secondly, they have to be an HR director, I believe, to train new recruits, to enhance skills, to get the best out of people, and to skill their staff to face the future. Third, they need to be a sales director, knowing how best to satisfy the needs of the client. Fourth, I think they have to actually be a client relationship manager. Today, just looking after and providing the best service is what the client requires. And in my opinion, we have moved from the position we were in some years ago, indeed when I started, where professionals merely had to be reactive. We then moved through a difficult step, I think, of becoming proactive. Today, professions, professionals have to be predictive. They have to anticipate what their clients require, to look after them, to look out for them, and ideally to provide the solutions before the client has actually necessarily decided that they have a question that requires that solution. But that, again, is not enough. I believe in the future, you will also have to be a project manager and a process engineer. And always, of course, a leader, a communicator, and an adaptable problem solver. Rest assured, at the university, you will have a lot of training that you have to undertake for we professionals to be effective. Because actually, whatever today's issues are, they will be different tomorrow. Never has change happened quite so quickly. Let me just spend two minutes on my particular uh, concept of the process engineer. I'm concerned that far too many professionals provide their services uh, as they always have. That's to say in a linear fashion. You go from step one to step two to step three. And always involving the partner or the senior manager, the senior member present involved in all parts of that process. And that will not work in the future. It's too expensive. The professional has, I believe, now to break down each part of the process in which they're involved, be it the audit, the court case, the pension review, the insurance claim, and determine which part can be done by a computer which by a clerical function, which by a well-trained administrator, which by the paralegal or junior trainee. And where is the essential value added, and where can that only be input by a senior, hugely experienced professional, and how can it be delivered? The professional can oversee, can quality control, but does not need to be there doing every part of the job. If you're going to be giving advice to a Chinese business, to someone in South America or wherever else in another developing country. You have to be able to do it remotely, electronically, and I believe you have to bring the work to the people and not as so often has been the case in the past where you move the people to the work. The best example I can give in this respect, which I hope is, 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 is understandable by all, is actually how an Airbus is constructed. The fuselage is made in one country, the wings in another, the engines in yet another, and then it's brought together and assembled in a different country again. And actually it's that assembly that involves the greatest level of skill. Each of the other functions is repetitive and has been perfected over time. Assembling them together to make those pieces of metal actually fly is the skill. And the skill of the professional is there, and that's where the, the value is added. And I believe that's the way professionals will have to look to deliver their service. And that's where I think the focus should be. And that's where the future of the industry lies. I have absolute and complete confidence that our professions can adapt to the future because actually that's what we've done throughout history. Spot the opportunity and pursue it relentlessly. You don't need imperial power, military power, massive population or even natural resources. What you need is a well-educated, well-trained series of minds that are adaptive, quick to react, anticipate future trends, treat people fairly, maintain those highest standards, and travel the world. And more to the point, have pride in what has been achieved and can be achieved. We are today celebrating the evidence of that anticipation by the university. A university that recognizes its part of the global world and is focusing internationally and seeking to skill each part of what I would describe as the chain of command and execution within professional services. Making sure that every level can perform more efficiently, more effectively, and therefore at a cheaper price, the objective of all businesses. Professional services, financial services, trained minds are the future. We may no longer be able to actually bend metal cheaper than others, 
or as my grandfather did, ship coal around the world. But actually we can show the world what the future will be in terms of financial and professional services, and we can show them that here in Glamorgan. Thank you.